Hi, Working Preachers. This is Matt Skinner. We're getting close to the end of our fundraising campaign, but you still have time to make a difference for working preachers in 200 countries and territories around the globe. Thanks to two anonymous longtime Luther Seminary donors with a passion for preaching and for supporting new preachers, we have a matching gift available. As soon as we raise $25,000 toward this fall campaign, a $10,000 matching gift will be unlocked. Gifts of any size will make a tremendous difference. We know you rely on the resources that Working Preacher provides, so we're asking for your help now to keep Working Preacher thriving and improving. Your support helps ensure that Working Preacher remains free and available to all, no matter where they are. You can make a one-time gift or a monthly gift securely online at workingpreacher.org slash donate. Thank you for supporting this vital ministry. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for All Saints Sunday, which falls on November 3rd, 2024. We have a separate new podcast for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, also November 3rd. So if you want those texts, we encourage you to listen to that podcast. But for All Saints, the texts are Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, Psalm 24, Revelation 21, 1 through 6a, and John 11, verses 32 through 44. Happy November, everybody. Those of you who are listening in the United States might be aware that there's some kind of an election or something happening two days after this Sunday, and we have re are recording this several weeks in advance, so we don't really know what's going on when you're listening to this, but I'm sure it's exciting, and we're here for you. And, you know, if you haven't started talking about Election Day or any kind of uh, maybe politically adjacent themes in your pulpit, it's probably too late to start now. <laughs> <laughs> So, probably. <laughs> you probably should have been doing that the last few months. But yeah. uh, but nevertheless, All Saints, what is the role of preaching on All Saints Sunday, my two homiletical professor friends? Good question. Joy, you have some thoughts? I was going to ask, did you mention the translations? No. This is but more exciting news. Do you want me to mention that? Yeah, why don't you mention sure. that? You might have noticed on the websites we have updated and we're starting to use the NRSV UE, which is the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition, which has essentially replaced the NRSV for the time being until this somebody decides to make a new translation. Then there'll be the more road. then there'll be more letters. <laughs> then there'll be exactly. it'll be longer. Yes, yes, right. The updated well, newly new revised of the original newly, authorized yes. version. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you two are delaying. Okay, so we got all that information. You out just there. preach the text on uh, on All Saints Sunday, or is there more? You do, but or you do and. How about that? Um, there's a recognition um, of the festivals, celebrations, and rituals of repetity. How's that? That we have uh, that invite us to. Um, pause, remember our community. And this is one way that we do that uh, in um, remembering those, many congregations will remember those who have died over the past year. Uh, it's an opportunity for both uh, a recognition of their, the lives uh, that have impacted us. It's also an opportunity, as you'll see in the chosen text, uh, to attend to the fact that uh, the life as we know it ends, we have the promise that we do not yet know of eternal life. And um, we grieve together. We uh, encourage one another together uh, through these promises of the faith. And so if you take this particular Sunday to do that, and there'll be some people in your congregation who are used to doing this, um, and they may have lost a loved one this year, and really want to follow that celebration ritual that has been done for many years. Uh, so if you're new to a congregation, you really want to know what their habits are for celebrating this. Uh, Caroline, you want to speak liturgically to this? <laughs> well, I think that, uh, yeah, what you said 
joy. And I think for the preacher to remember that because of those rituals and because of those practices of remembrance that are typically embedded in the service and could be uh, particular hymns or an anthem, that the sermon doesn't have to do everything. And uh, so I think that's one thing when you, when you, especially when you come to All Saints, it's, well, it's almost like preaching a funeral sermon and in a way, and a funeral sermon is, is in the midst of remembrances and favorite hymns and all kinds of things. And so that you think maybe with each of the texts, how there might be one claim of promise of eternal life or claim of promise of resurrection or life forever with Jesus that you could raise out as a particular word of promise for people. And the preacher would need to decide that, of course, based on their context and what word does their congregation need to hear. But maybe, yeah, maybe first to hear that word that your sermon doesn't have to do at all. And that that you can you know lift out one word perhaps and not what I don't literally mean one word but I mean a verse or or something that would that you know would really connect with the kind of losses that your congregation has experienced this year. Good, I think too. It's a, it's you know it's a funeral service with where the nerves are a little less raw mm-hmm. for most folks potentially. But it's also a service that allows you to connect a variety of funerals, you know, that like Maureen's death connects to Calvin's death, connects to Jessica's death and, you know, whatever that looks like. That just as we live together in Christ, we also die together in Christ. And that there's Mm -hmm. a kind of connection to, and we acknowledge what this does to a community, what death does, but which might be a nice segue to John, which is not just about Jesus and Lazarus, but there's a lot of other people in the scene as well. Well, and and also the fact that this is the, you know, this is the last sign. And so the very next chapter will have Jesus entry into Jerusalem and then nothing really happens there except for his, he's got one little last speech and, but then the rest of the rest of the chapters through 17 or his time with his disciples. And so this, this last sign is significant. I think the other thing that is really so powerful for me and the commentary brings this up, uh, brings this up, notes this is that, and I say this I probably every year that we talk about it, but that the pattern in the gospel of John of a sign and then conversation around the sign and then Jesus discourse about the sign is reversed here so that what ends up happening is that the dialogue and the discourse that's a formal way of saying that the emphasis is not is not on the sign itself which is very short but what it points to and what it means and so what that ends up happening is to pay attention to how much narrative space is given to the questions of grief and loss and and how how to deal with death and what what questions and what our experiences are in the face of death and so when you look at the fact that you know really 42 verses are dedicated to grief and and loss and two verses to the actual sign for me, that says that the that the sermon spends some time affirming Jesus' presence in and uh, and experience of grief, and uh, and what difference does that make for our own places of grief that uh, that we have that emphasis of Jesus having those same feelings, and I think too, not just about not not only about. Uh, the death of Lazarus, his friend, but he also the the way in which he weeps for the grief that it brings for his other friends and for the co- community. I uh, I think he also grieves for his coming death. There are a lot of connections, mm-hmm. foreshadowings between the death of Lazarus or the raising of Lazarus and Jesus' own resurrection. 
And But I also think, and I've said this before, that I think Jesus weeps for death itself, that he can't take it away. Uh, at the end of the day, yes, the resurrection will overcome death, but still death has to happen. And uh, that that Jesus weeps for that in that knowledge that uh, that he can't take it away. He can't take away that loss. He can't take away that that grief of of death. Um, and and the, and for me, that's very that's in a lot of ways really comforting. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the uh, centering, uh, particularly on this particular Sunday, uh, on the the shared grief um, uh, that Jesus understands. Uh, that Jesus' grief is more than his own. Um, and also, um, as we, as you lifted up the leading to his own death and the reality of death continuing uh, and it is also an acknowledgement or might be an acknowledgement of just the circumstances of the world. Um, there's, in this text, because of Jesus' delay, great confusion, both when he arrives and when he doesn't go immediately, the conversations that happen. And the reality is that's where we live today, whether we're talking about death of a hope, death of an ideal, or a death of a loved one. And uh, whatever that moment is, um, it's nice to know that you don't have to grieve alone, uh, and it might be worth acknowledging that we actually see that played out in, in this, uh, uh, described in this particular scene, the shared uh, grief that goes beyond just uh, the loss of a loved one. Yeah, we're all, I think, um, kind of in orbit around this, uh, how moving it is how Jesus's response, not just the fact that he, that he weeps, but also the other lines that the commentary brings out about being disturbed in spirit and, and greatly moved. And I, I do love the question, why does he weep? And I've gotten a lot of traction out of that teaching on this passage in the past, but I also would hope the sermon doesn't try to offer too strong of a kind of, this is what that means position, at least not at the expense of just reiterating that he does weep, that he is grieved, and really begin there and stay there. And that this is more than just an expression of empathy. You know, like like his prayer, you know, his prayer says, well, I don't really need to pray because the crowd here just needs to listen to me say that. You know, I, and I think that that might make some of us think like, oh, well, the tears are just modeling or just kind of, let me show them how human I really am. And I don't think that's what's going on. I think the, the weeping itself is kind of like what you said, Caroline, that, that death can't be just wiped out or taken away, or at least not yet. And that for God to experience that, for me, is one of the most amazing aspects of the incarnation. Death is supposed to be the great defiler in so much of the Old Testament's understanding. What makes God God and not human is God cannot die and does not die. And there's this kind of incommensurable relationship between God and death, but then that God would take that on, that the word would take that on in John, uh, is remarkable. And related to that then is that God would also grieve because we sometimes think grieve is about not being able to be in control or grief is about, or grief needs an explanation, but we don't have to explain the grief. We just say he does it and it doesn't need a reason. It's part of what it means to be human just like think, death is. Mm -hmm. I think too, the way in which the text reiterates the fact that this is, that Lazarus is really dead. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> uh, you know, Four days dead. Yeah, that, but also Martha, the sister of the dead man, uh, the dead man came out. So it's, yeah, it it, it doesn't let you the text doesn't let you, you know, metaphorize this or spiritualize this. So that it, with the with the emphasis of the of the death is also the emphasis of the grief, and uh, and 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 Jesus' own reaction to it. I think another thing that I find really important here too is 
the way in which you interpret the move of Jesus to Father, uh, to mm-hmm. this this moment of speaking to God. And while it's theologically true in John, all has been given to him by God. And so this is not going to happen without, it's, you know, it's a moment to reveal God's glory, which is part of the signs. From a very human perspective, isn't that exactly what Jesus needs right now, is to connect with his father and to connect with, uh, to, to make that connection and uh, and which you don't really, you know, you don't get that on the cross necessarily, but, you know, you don't have father forgive them for they know what, what to do. Um, and so this moment of, this moment of realization, I think on the part of Jesus of his own impending death then becomes a moment to, uh, to call upon God. And I think there's, uh, I think there's something in that for us as well. In many ways, um, Matt, your caution against um, our adding to what we think the why uh, Jesus wept. Um, if we if we avoid adding that, we get to linger in what is actually in the text, which you've just pointed out, Caroline. And I think there's so much that really is there in the text. I really appreciate both of you uh, giving that caution um, and also uh, lifting up uh, the reality that, that we do see in the text that sometimes can get lost. Let's move forward in time <laughs> to the end of all things, um, Isaiah, or at least some kind of a culmination. Uh, so Isaiah 25 and Revelation 21, we might want to consider together because they share imagery or Revelation borrows the Isaiahic imagery. I've said this before, this is some of my, if there's one promise in the Bible that it better be true, it, it had better be that God wipes away tears. Um, mm-hmm. just, just such a, a, a beautiful image. Um, but it's of course only part of what's going on in both of these, but it's this beautiful promise of the destruction of death, or as the commentary puts it, totalizing obliteration (laughs) of (laughs) death. Um, But by a God who's incredibly powerful to do that, but also incredibly compassionate. And and, um, what's the word I want? I don't know. Tender Mm. Mm. in this response about wiping tears away. Well, and two, if just to, we, and yeah, we can go back and forth, but with the revelation passage, the emphasis on the wipe, yes, the wiping away of the tears, but of course, also the emphasis of God's presence in all of this. And so you have the, you have the holy city come, you see the home, and that's the NRS. N-R-S-V-U-E translation, see the home of God, but it, the, it's the same word as he will dwell. The tent of God is among mortals and God will tent with them or tab- tabernacle with them, which is, of course, that the, the, the promise of God's presence in the most dire of situations uh, in the case of the wilderness wanderings, but uh, here especially. And then also the... I think, too, in verse 6, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the way in which God's presence is is here, but also all-encompassing from the beginning and from the end. And so the way in which a sermon might speak into that, too, of what is God's response to uh what is God's response to death or what is God's, what is God's hope for uh, the, a future with God is this, is this being with us uh, and the promise of that, that, that presence has never, will never, never be different. It'll always be the beginning. It'll be, it's our beginning or our end. It's our alpha and it's our, our omega. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm-hmm. And it comes in this context of newness. So a new city, you've got the sense of a banquet uh, in Isaiah mm-hmm. as well. Um, and, and the joy that surrounds that, the joy of a banquet, the joy of a new home uh, and seeing God's home around here, the joy of you know those who are thirsty being given water. Uh, mm-hmm. This, And so I, I think All Saints Day is a time certainly to 
acknowledge grief, validate grief, not try to fix grief, but it's also a time for refreshment. Uh, and these passages at least promise the hope of refreshment. Or just, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a day to hold out the promise of, of refreshment and also to validate that there's nothing wrong with yearning for that. I'm um, looking at the uh, 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 commentary that uh, Katie Heffelfinger does for Isaiah. Uh, uh, she highlighted the imaginative power of metaphor that is made available in poetry. And uh, I lingered also on this feast, uh, just a recognition that, uh, uh, at least with my family, whenever somebody dies, we eat well. Um, that, that that's just one of the things we do. And uh, linking this with Revelation, I often will think of Revelation and um, the, the banquet that is promised. And um, we, we see the, I'm doing a new thing from Isaiah in Revelation, but that same tie, you were saying, Matt, that we link these two texts or we can, that same tie is made in, in this feast in Isaiah and the final banquet uh, uh, in, uh, 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 when time as we know it ends. And so uh, I think, I don't know, I got this idea as I was, I was reading through this, um, maybe adding a new ritual to the way that your church celebrates all saints and including a potluck or some type of formal dinner, I don't know, uh, uh, or informal dinner, I don't know. But it just seemed like uh, if um, we're going to talk about, as we did with the John text, uh, shared grieving, that maybe that shared meal might also be a way to remember the community of saints uh, that once gathered at table with us and now gathers with um, the the sats eternal anything we want to say about Psalm 24 don't well, all joke at once come on <laughs> well I think I oh, I think I it you know it's it is this uh, this claim of the all-encompassing presence and power of God I mean part of what part of why we can have this hope in God swallowing up death and wiping away tears is the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. And so that, 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 um, yeah, that all encompassing reality of God's glory and God's power is what the psalmist, right, gives witness to. And, uh, in verse five, and they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. And I think sometimes we imagine, I think frequently people imagine that salvation is, you know, this future eternal life. Uh, but there is something to be said for, well, this is certainly true in John, but there's something to be said for how that foretaste of salvation or that understanding of what it means to be saved or uh, is is fundamentally in the promise of the presence of God and that God keeps us from the beginning to the end and I uh, and so how how might maybe a preacher imagine that part of what All Saints Sunday does is is not just look ahead right to uh, uh, to that promise, but that that promise is ours here and now, and where and where and how do we experience God's keeping of us, God's dwelling of us, God's tabernacling with us here and now? As as you know, salvation is already here. It's uh, something really critical for us to remember is that uh, the incarnation is about the reminder that God is with us. You know, the, these verses say that. Um, but sometimes the, we forget that the whole of the incarnation is to remind us that God is with us and that God is not in our thoughts, that God is not just in our, um, in our liturgy, but that like Jesus, God is with us, you know, sitting beside us, eating with us, working with us, uh, touching us, grieving with us. And, uh, I appreciate it. Rolf's, uh, uh, commentary where he reminds us that this is a processional um, uh, uh, liturgy, that this is, um, um, th th for me, another 
ritual or, or habit of All Saints is the music. You mentioned this, Caroline, the music that is a part of that service. And in the midst of that, uh, you know, the, 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 the song, uh, lift up your heads, O ye gate, and be ye lifted up. Um, and who is the, that the King of glory may come in? Who is the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty? It's a wonderful, great song. But as much as I love the song, Caroline, what you just lifted up for us is a reminder that what this is, is for us to be in the place where God is. And in the midst of shared grieving, we also are sharing that God is with us. What a wonderful uh, way to do that as community. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.